The Saints barely avoid going 0-2 with an ugly win over the Browns. How two of the team's young stars helped bail out the black and gold. Plus, a thrilling last-second win at Auburn keeps LSU unbeaten. And it was a tough week for Tulane, Southeastern, and Nichols, with all three schools losing Saturday. Bottom line, it's a win, and ultimately in the NFL, that's all that really matters. But it was not what you'd call a confidence-inspiring win. I'm Doug Mouton. Welcome to 4th Down on 4. And that's where we'll start. Do you still believe the Saints are a playoff team, or do two less-than-great efforts have you thinking this season might not include a postseason? The poll is open, yes or no. Vote now on our mobile app or our website. Ricardo LeCompte has the story from the Superdome. It's hard to win in the NFL. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Just ask the Cleveland Browns. Ooh, 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 ooh. 631 days since the franchise last experienced the win. It's only been 252 days since the Saints tasted victory. And it would have lasted longer if New Orleans didn't find their way in the final quarter. Really shouldn't have come down to that. I think if we're talking about playing our best football, today was not that. There's a lot of things that we need to improve upon. A week after the defense couldn't stop Ryan Fitzpatrick and the Bucks, the offense struggled putting points on the board this week. The Browns' defensive line caused havoc. Drew Brees missed a couple of throws, and the Saints turned the ball over twice in the first half. Four turnovers in two games. Those mistakes will burn the Saints moving forward. Now, Thomas and Ginn were responsible for the ones on Sunday, but both players did not want that to define how this game ended offensively for New Orleans. Make a play. Uh, enough was enough. I fumbled earlier. I, I, I needed to respond and help my teammates, and um, that's what I did, and I, I, still, I still owe them. But the Pro Bowl receiver did pay them back in the final frame. Thomas found Pater on the Saints' first drive of the fourth to cut the deficit to 12 to 10. And with 2.40 left in the game, Thomas made a great snag in the end zone with two defenders on him to give the Saints their first lead of the game. Thomas finished with 12 catches. He's got 28 receptions through the first two games, the most by any player in NFL history through the first two weeks. It's only week two. Um, now, how can, I, how can I add more value? How can I do more? It came down to the defense to seal this first win. And up to that point, the D bounced back from an awful first week, recording its first three sacks of the season and its first turnover of the year. A Marcus Williams interception that set up the go-ahead scoring drive. That's what we needed. That's what we was preaching. You know, we got to get the turnover. You know, because the offense wasn't rolling at first. We were able to make enough plays on defense to, um, to get us a win today. So definitely a step in the right direction, obviously. Things we can clean up on, things we can improve upon. Like this, with 116 remaining on fourth and five. Terod Taylor went deep to Antonio Callaway, who got behind the defense to haul in the game-tying touchdown. But on the extra point, Zane Gonzalez pushed it left for a second missed point after try. A tie game, and the Saints march right down the field with under a minute to go. There's no quit or no worry in this team. You know, if we're down or we're up, we're playing like, you know, we're, we're just playing to put points on the board. Drew Brees hit Ted Ginn Jr. for a 42-yard run after the catch. And then Will Lutz atoned for his missed field goal in the first half. He kicked a go-ahead 44-yard field goal with 21 seconds left right through the uprights. I think the whole game, though, I, in the back of my head, I knew with how close it was that it was going to be a, it was going to be decided by a couple points. And you know, I'm, I'm always ready when my number's called, and fortunately, we got it done. Let's execute it. Zane Gonzalez didn't. The Browns got in position for a 52-yarder to tie it, but Gonzalez missed it as time expired. I'm encouraged we won, but let's not kid ourselves. We're in this early part of the season, which year after year, you, you know, this is this is. Uh, where you hear your opportunity to improve happens most. We've got a lot to do to improve. Despite the miscues, the Saints stayed resilient to earn this W. New Orleans will enjoy it because it's hard to win in the NFL. Yeah! At the Superdome, Ricardo LeCompte, fourth down on four. All right, thanks, Ricardo. Here's where the Saints sit. Right now, one game behind the Bucks. The NFC South is a combined five and three. 
Remember last year at this time, two weeks in, a hurricane had canceled the Bucks opener. The Saints were in last place at 0-2, two games back, two games in. And, of course, they rallied to win the division. So right now, this looks a lot better than that. Ricardo LeCompte now has some analysis from week two. All right, Doug, Joel Erickson from the Attic Fit joining me, and we're going to just go over this ugly win, but still a win for the Saints. They avoid perhaps probably a really ugly loss to the Browns. Uh, just your impressions of them being able to uh, be resilient enough to come back and beat the Browns. Well, really, Michael Thomas and Marcus Williams kind of made the most of what was a pretty bad day. Running game was bad all day. Uh, the passing game really didn't hit anything until the fourth quarter. Even the defense, it took a long time to get the big plays that, that you kind of hope for out of this defense. Uh, but Michael Thomas, two touchdown catches, Marcus Williams interception, and they come away with, like you said, it would have been a terrible loss given that the Browns have, haven't had a win now in 19 straight. Let's go back to that fourth quarter, and it just seemed like, it, like you were saying, they were struggling trying to run the ball, and it got to a point where it was just like, all right, we're going to ride the, the, the backs of Breeze, Thomas, and Kamara and, and throw everything else out the window. That's what it appeared. Did, did you see the same thing? Yeah, it kind of felt like that, but, but even with even – with the way it was going, it just felt like they kind of broke through a little bit. There, there was a big 18-yard carry from Kamara that was really the first run of any consequence they had, and it kind of got them going. Um, but, but even then, even then, the offense was kind of a little stop and start there in the fourth quarter that the pick from Williams getting them down in the red zone really helped in terms of coming back in the game. Yeah, and you have to give credit to that Browns defensive line because they were able to get some pressure. They were able to stop the run because you look at the rushing totals and outside of Kamara, I mean, there was, there was nothing going on there. Well, every, all the talk coming in was about Miles Garrett, the Cleveland Browns freakishly talented defensive end and true to form the Saints as they have done for a long time against edge rushers. He had a bad day. He only had one tackle, but their defensive tackle Larry Ogunjobi was unbelievable all game long. He had two sacks. He was close to several more. One of them got called back for penalty. And I really think he controlled the interior of the line in the running game. They missed Mark Ingram. They, they missed Mark Ingram, but on top of that, there just wasn't a lot of room for Kamara or Mike Gillisley to, to make any hay up the middle. So that's something that they're really going to have to fix going forward to have that kind of inside out running game that we were used to last year. I know everybody was freaking out after they get, uh, the defense gave up 41, I know it was 48, but 41 points against the Bucks in week one. A better performance today. Do you feel like, all right, we, we're getting a sense of, of what this defense, maybe it's not as bad as we think. Well, maybe not just what happened here today, but elsewhere in the NFL, mm -hmm. Ryan Fitzpatrick threw for 400 yes. yards again mm -hmm. against the Philadelphia Eagles, which makes this, the week one game look a little bit better considering he went out and did it against the, the or defending Super Bowl champs this week. So. I think this is more of what we expected from the defense. There still hasn't been, it didn't feel like until the Williams interception that there were the kind of big plays you expect from this defense. I kind of expected this defense to be more of a, maybe they give up some yards, but a lot of big plays, that kind of thing. And they got to get make more of those going forward. Yeah, that, it, that defense has to be opportunistic in order for the Saints to be successful. Joel, appreciate your time. Coming up. LSU used a second half strike and a clutch game-winning field goal to take down seventh-ranked Auburn. We'll analyze how much this has done for Ed Ogeron's stock going forward. And later, Tulane drops a game the Waves should have won, and Nichols and Southeastern also lose this weekend. This was supposed to be a down year at LSU. With a great recruiting class coming in this spring, LSU was expected to take its lumps this fall. Of course, that hasn't happened. The Tigers are now ranked sixth in the country after their second win over a top 10 team. Andrew Doak has the story from Auburn. Who would have imagined that this LSU season would have started like this? Hey, go Tigers, baby. Go Tigers. And it all has to do with two graduate transfers who the Tigers took a chance on. <laughs> Just as Tiger fans asked, they received. On Saturday at Auburn, LSU offensive coordinator Steve Insminger brought more to the table. The offense opened up. And on the day, Burrow had five pass plays of 15 yards or more. They ran quick passing games and use screens to get their athletes in space. And to cap off their opening drive, they even used running back Clyde Edwards Hilaire in short yardage in goal line situations. Number 22, Clyde Edwards Hilaire, carries for the LSU touchdown. The defense set the table for LSU. On the second play from scrimmage, Tiger safety Grant Delpit landed an interception. And then Edwards Hilaire cashed in on the offensive side, 
to put the Tigers on the board with a 7-0 lead. The start for the LSU offense couldn't have been much better. And halfway through the second quarter, they built a 10-0 lead with this 33-yarder from Cole Tracy. But that's when Auburn decided to wake up. Auburn quarterback Jarrett Stidham led them to 21 straight points on three straight drives. And suddenly, LSU was down 11 with their backs against the wall. Once Auburn took a 21-10 second half lead, the next four LSU offensive drives went punt, field goal, punt, punt. But the LSU defense continued to give the purple and gold a chance. With roughly eight and a half minutes left to go, LSU quarterback Joe Burrow made his most clutch connection of the game with wide receiver Derek Dillon. pass to Derek Dillon uh, gave us a chance to win the game. He made an incredible play, great pass by Joe. We needed we needed that big play. Um, and from there we felt the momentum swing. I saw it was two high safeties, cover two, and I guess every coverage we have somewhere we got to go with the ball. And against two high safeties, that's where you got to go with the ball. And I just, I just tried to get it up over that linebacker, and Derek Dillon made a great play for me. But next, LSU had to ask their defense for one more stop. We got a hell of a quarterback in Joe. Um, never cool. I told him, wait about two minutes, we'll get you the ball back. And Rashard Lawrence made good on his promise. After Auburn built an 11-point lead, the LSU defense held them scoreless on their final five drives, setting up a potential game-winning drive for Burrow. Burrow was far from perfect on the day, but when it counted most over his final two offensive drives, he was three for five for 88 yards and one score. With two minutes left, LSU down two, and with the game hanging in the balance on fourth and seven at the Auburn 48, Burrow delivered again with this strike to Steven Sullivan to move the chains. Two plays later, an Auburn defender was called for pass interference while guarding Justin Jefferson. And all of a sudden, the Tigers were in range for a game-winning kick. We thought about it going on third down. We actually thought about it going for the field going third down. That's how much confidence we have in it. Three plays later, LSU would wind it down to two seconds to set up a 41-yard try for all the marbles. And for their first-year quarterback, the anxiety made it too much to watch. Kick is up, line drive, kick, and it's good! I didn't watch it. I had my hands, in, my head in my hands, uh, but I had tried. I had trust Cole. Um, I just kind of didn't want to didn't want to watch at that time. I just seen him make a bunch of field goals in practice, man. I, I feel good about the kid. I, I know his character. I watch him practice. I watch him prepare. No, there was no doubt in my mind he would make it. I knew on Monday that it would potentially come down to this. <laughs> um, once once we uh, got past Southeastern. Um, you know that when you're playing at Auburn, it's, it's going to be a close game in all three phases. LSU learned a lot about themselves on Saturday, but most notably, the state of Louisiana learned more about the two grad transfers they know the least about. And the clutch play from that man right there. Sometimes Burrow, Tracy, Ogeron, and this entire LSU football team showed gumption and resolve in a hostile environment. This team seems to thrive on others' doubt, and maybe it's because they all have something in common. Tracy is a former D2 kicker, making every moment count in his final year of eligibility. Burrow, a backup quarterback who was good, but not good enough for Ohio State. And then there's Ogeron, who's always been a school's second option. In Auburn, they showed they were over, being everyone's second fiddle. From Jordan-Hare Stadium, Andrew Doak, fourth down on four. All right, thanks, Andrew. LSU's next major test, of course, is against Georgia. That is four weeks away. The Bulldogs right now rank second in the country, but you can't look ahead. The Tigers' next two are against Louisiana Tech and Ole Miss, both at home. Andrew Doak has some analysis now after the game at Auburn. I right, joined by Scott Rabelais of The Advocate in Baton Rouge. This was an absolute thriller tonight, and Ogeron is not going to say it, but I think this was the biggest win of his career. You look at this season. Some people were guessing six, seven wins. Now they have two top ten wins in the first three weeks. 
Well, you know, last year's win over Auburn when they came back down from 20-0 uh, was pretty big, too. Uh, may maybe Ed would want to play them more often, but I don't know if anybody else's heart can, can take it. But this was a huge win. I mean, LSU, no one thought LSU could be 3-0 uh, after three games playing Miami and then Auburn, two top-10 teams. First time since 2011 they've beaten two top-10 teams in one season. And, uh, yeah, I mean, everyone said he's got the hottest seat in college football. I mean, you could take bets in Vegas saying, uh, saying that he has the hottest seat and uh, cooled off considerably now after these two huge wins. It's, it's an unbelievable, unscriptable start for LSU. Auburn went up 21-10. Then the defense gave them a chance in the end. But let's get first to Joe Burrow and Cole Tracy. They score nine points over the final couple drives to be able to win this game. That's why you bring a guy like Burrow in to be your quarterback and Cole Tracy to be the place kicker who only missed one field goal today and has been steady for them so far. LSU's field goal kicking was uh, was a liability last year. I mean, they, they, they had one of the worst field goal percentages in the country. They get Cole Tracy, who was the top kicker in these lower college levels. And one thing about a, a guy coming from Division II, you, know, you don't want a Division II linebacker or maybe a quarterback, but kicking is kicking. And he's, as, he, as Cole said afterwards, it's the same dimensions for the, for the field goals. And this is what they expected him to do. And the fact that he came through, I probably didn't surprise too many people from LSU. As, as for Joe Burrow, he wasn't perfect. He said he didn't think he played that great a game, but he leads the team. He gives them confidence. He does. He just seems like a winner. He seems like a guy who comes through in the clutch, and you saw that here today in the fourth quarter. And Burrow said he didn't really feel like he played exceptional when it came to this game, but that 71-yard touchdown to Derek Dillon dropped it right over the linebacker, right in front of the safety. That was the play that really gave them the momentum to go win this game. How impressed were you with that throw right there? Because I think that was the most impressive throw Burroughs made so far. Hey, look, from our vantage point, at first it's like he's throwing into triple coverage. Like, what is he doing? But you saw it, he just, like you said, just laid it in right there over the linebacker. And the, the uh, one of the defensive backs took a bad angle and Dylan was off. So that's the spark they needed. They were hanging in, they're hanging in, but nothing really was happening for LSU offensively. They only had the two field goals after scoring on that short drive after the Delpit interception in the first quarter. So that gave them the, 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 uh, the opportunity and probably put a little fear into Auburn that they could lose the game. But they, they didn't feel just a few minutes earlier. And the LSU defense continued to hold them over. You saw a Greedy Williams interception, another three and out, while the offense kind of you know, got stuck in the mud there in the second half. Dave Aranda is, is such a great defensive coordinator, especially when it comes to adjustments. What did you see from the defense during that time where they were able to hold over the offense? Uh, that's the thing. Uh, uh, the, the defensive looks Aranda gives at the start of a game are not what you're going to see the entire game. He's going to change things up. And I, I, th I just thought uh, they kind of bogged down Auburn's running game, which had gotten some momentum in the middle part of the game when they scored those 21 straight points. And then they finally started getting some more pressure on Jarrett Stidham. And I, I think uh, they made him a little uncomfortable and, and it worked him into some throws that that uh, were just off target enough to give LSU the ball back, you know, the last few times that they needed to do it, and it turned out to be just enough. Won the turnover battle, and the offense right. still hasn't turned the ball over, which is a formula for winning. All right, here in Auburn, Alabama, Scott Rabelais of The Advocate in Baton Rouge. Thanks for taking the time. Back to you guys. Coming up, a gamble by Tulane head coach Willie Fritz backfires for the Green Wave as their loss to UAB makes reaching a bowl game this season much tougher. And it was a tough weekend as well for both the Lions and the Colonels as they fall short in Southland matchups. Tulane's road to a bowl game got a lot tougher Saturday when the Green Wave lost at UAB. With the schedule getting much tougher next week, this was the game the Wave should have won. On the keeper, Erdley walks in for the touchdown. Tulane entered Saturday's game in Birmingham as a three and a half point favorite, but quickly trailed UAB by 14 early on. Then after cutting the lead to seven in the second quarter, Willie Fritz gambled, going for it on fourth and seven near midfield. And that's when the Blazers sacked quarterback Jonathan Banks. They forced a fumble and returned it to give UAB a 21-7 lead. Well, the analytics for us told us to go. And I uh, decided not to go for it. We called timeout. I went with the book, and you know it doesn't kill us if we, we hang on the ball and it, you know they have to go you know 60 yards. But unfortunately, uh, I, I wish I would have gone against the book. Banks struggled badly Saturday, going just 7 for 24 for 180 yards, two touchdowns, and an interception. And it almost got worse before Thacarius Keys got a key interception in the end zone just before halftime. In the second half, receiver Darnell Mooney caught a pair of touchdowns as part of his 123-yard day. And the Wave fought back, tying it up on this Merrick Glover 40-yard field goal. But UAB got the ball back and drove 90.
93 yards for the game-winning score. It drops Tulane to one and two, and the schedule gets much more difficult the next two weeks. The Green Wave play at Ohio State next week, followed by Memphis, and five more wins on the schedule are looking much harder to come by for Willie Fritz's team going forward. It was also a tough weekend for both Nichols and Southeastern. The Lions hosted the defending Southland Conference champions from Central Arkansas, and Southeastern actually outgained the Bears, but they lost the turnover battle 3-0 to zero and lost the game 33-25. You know, Tim Rebo has done an unbelievable job. Nichols, meanwhile, traveled to Lake Charles to play McNeese State, but former Holy Cross Tiger quarterback James Tabry threw two TD passes for the Cowboys, and McNeese Nice won it 20 to 10. We're back with more fourth down on four in a minute. The majority of fans who answered our poll said yes, they believe the Saints are a playoff team, but we got a lot of no's too. I voted yes, but more than a third of the votes say no. For producer Danny Rockwell, photographer Adam Nay, Ricardo LeCompte, and Andrew Doak, I'm Doug Mouton. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week on fourth down on four.